I recognize the bill author, the member from Washington, Representative Dean, to introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is the Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. I want to thank uh, our health, health and Human Services staff, House Research Randy Chun, Danielle Pinelli, Elizabeth Clark Fess, Sarah Sunderman, our fiscal analyst Doug Berg, the Revisor's Office, Sandy Glass, Annie Fox, Lauren Betke, Adam Hoosman, uh, DFL Research, Cassandra Moore, our GOP Research, Bethany Dora Biella and Chelsea Whitman. CLA is Shiloh Larson, CA's Laura Larson and Holly Iverson. Uh, we uh, have a great bill before you, members. It's uh, comprised of about 129 bills from both Republicans and Democrats uh, that deal with providing care for Minnesota's most vulnerable and uh, over a million people on Medicaid uh, in, our, in our nursing homes, in our hospitals, home and community-based services. Uh, touches many, many lives, every single one of your constituents. Uh, we really want to thank the work of the committee, uh, both the Republican members as well as the Democrat members, and uh, we look forward to the uh, debate ahead. The bill uh, spends um, about $14.32 billion in state funds, about $19.7 billion in federal funds. Uh, we've looked for significant savings and reforms that we're going to talk about a little bit through the debate today. We look forward to that. Uh, but I want to highlight some specific areas of the bill, and I'd like to send it over to the uh, policy uh, committee chair, uh, Joe Schumacher. He will yield. I recognize the member from Rock, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I just wanted to touch on a couple of points today uh, that we had in the Health and Human Service omnibus bill. Uh, we continue to prioritize seniors and the uh, disabled in this bill today. When we look at the value-based reimbursement system that we implemented in 2015, what we were able to do is reform the entire system that we had for the way we funded our nursing homes so that we were able to reform it, build up the workforce, and uh, bring something forward into the future that would continue with the reforms that we have. What we uh, learned, though, in that process of having major reforms is that we have to polish that language as we move forward. The more we learn about it, the more we uh, can improve upon it, and that's what we're doing with this bill today. And so uh, for our, our nursing homes and for the value-based reimbursement system that we have, we're preserving access to high-quality nursing facility services throughout the state by providing greater workforce growth. And I believe uh, Chair Keel will talk more about the work of the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee, especially on the workforce area, but we're expanding scholarships to help more nurses get into the loan forgiveness program and providing more access to those dollars so that people have a chance to expand their career there. We're improving transparency to the rate systems that we have with our nursing homes so that consumers only have two times a year where they see their, their rates fluctuate instead of the month-by-month -month system that we have now. We also enhance accountability in the system overall and the integrity of the program by requiring an ongoing report from DHS for the value-based reimbursement system. Most of uh, that is found in Article 2 that we have today. We also have Article 9 of the bill that uh, also continues to polish some of the recodification things that we worked on last year. That one is uh, entirely technical in nature. It came from our uh, uh, nonpartisan research staff. It cleans up technical corrections and cross-references. The other point that I wanted to uh, touch on briefly today is the disability waiver rate system because we we're able to find some major reforms with that. Most of you know that uh, we have over the years been moving away from the county-based uh, rate setting system for our disability waiver rates and moving to a statewide system. And within that, it takes some time to get that working the way we want. We've been introducing and transitioning to that for the last couple of years. We are finding ways that we can improve on the system that we had and polish that up, and so we're doing that in this bill. We're doing changes in rates uh, for the overnight sleep staff, for the housing access coordination, the licensed practical nurse, the definition of, of a day, the nursing assistants. We're reforming with uh, new employment services, with the absence studies on what a day is for absence and utilization, and we are also working on the transportation issue uh, that we have 
uh, within the disability waiver rate system setting and uh, making sure that we're doing it in a fair way that that is also easier for uh, providers of uh, disability services to provide the transportation that they need with that. Um, also within uh, what we're doing with disability waiver rate system is that we're allowing for a 7% rate increase to move forward in the bill uh, from what we had uh, this last year. That's an inflationary increase that uh, we have chosen to recognize in this bill and uh, not push off uh, back onto the uh, rates that were increased a few years ago. And so with that, members, I will yield to the subcommittee uh, chairs that we had here this year, uh, Representative Deb Keel with the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee. Members, it's too loud in the chamber. Uh, members are having trouble hearing. Please take your conversations and apparently now your phone calls into the retiring room or into one of the alcoves. Uh, please be respectful of those who are trying to listen to the debate. Please take your conversations off of the House floor. The next warning won't be as nice. The member from Polk, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Subcommittee of Aging and Long-Term Care worked once again on uh, aging. As we all know, that is becoming a large demographic in Minnesota. Um, the things that we did in, in aging and long-term care were to uh, develop a nursing or work, expand a nursing and ed facility education scholarships. This will help uh, address our workforce shortages along with um, uh, nursing or with nursing facility staff to expand the nurse eligible to receive scholarships reimbursing uh, student loan expenses and travel uh, training expenses. Uh, last Sunday session, I, I don't know if you remember, we funded scholarships for recently hired gra or graduated RNs and LPNs working within uh, at least uh, 10 hours in, uh, in nursing homes uh, and uh, we're expanding that to meet um, uh, the require, uh, meeting the work requirements. Additionally, we are including nurses uh, agreeing to, uh, helping nurses agreeing to practice uh, in housing and uh, with services for home, or for home care providers. Um, one thing uh, that I've worked on in the past and we uh, brought back was the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Working Group. Uh, the working group sunset in 2011, and uh, uh, we've done some research on that and, and uh, want to keep looking at that as we know that that is a very costly and uh, there is no response, uh, no, no way to halt Alzheimer's. And so there's some great research going on in, uh, at the university and Mayo Clinic and others, um, but uh, there's a lot of cost to uh, families and the residences where uh, many of our family have to live eventually for their safety. So um, we're working, um, we'll expand that working group and work on things like uh, financing long-term care, making public aware, uh, risk reduction, and dementia-specific uh, training for caregivers. Uh, we also uh, added the Senior Care Workforce Innovation Grant Program where we'll uh, establish a senior care workforce innovation grant program, which is aimed in increasing the pool of caregivers working in the senior care services. The grants must be used to fund pilot projects, uh, programs to expand existing programs to, re to recruit and train individuals to work in those 65 plus and receiving services through the home and community-based setting, adult daycare, home care services, or a nursing home. Um, and then finally, we built on the uh, successes of last session in 2015 when we passed the most comprehensive nursing home reform in 30 years, resulting in better quality care for nursing home residents, higher wages for our valued caregivers, this year, we built upon this through following up reforms aimed at preserving access to high quality nursing facility services throughout the state, providing funding necessary to meet the workforce changes and challenges. We've strengthened key areas in the existing law to provide the appropriate funding for nursing home facilities costs. With that, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I will, um, I believe, the subcommittee on child care, Representative Franson. 
She will yield. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I'm very excited to be speaking um, in front of you on the House floor today about our update um, on child care and what is actually in the bill. Um, and it was a complete honor to chair the Subcommittee on Child Care Access and Affordability. And there is no greater joy for me than to be able to work on this issue, especially since I have uh, the background as a former licensed child care provider myself. First, some thank yous are in order, Mr. Speaker and members. I appreciated the bipartisan work the entire committee did to address together. I believe that when we work together, things get done. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I want to thank Vice Chair Roz Peterson and DFL uh, lead Peggy, uh, Representative Peggy Flanagan for their leadership. And thanks to the staff, the CEA Laura Larson and the CLA um, Karen Larson and partisan research researchers Bethany Doro Biala and Dave Sullivan and nonpartisan researchers Sarah Sunderman. You guys were a complete asset to the committee. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So I'm super excited about the many bipartisan supported reforms we have in Chair Dean's bill. Our policies will um, address access and affordability by improving relationships and communications with the county, DHS, and child care providers. Ultimately, we are working to reverse the shortage of family child care providers. The situation is so dire, it has been called a quiet crisis. More family providers will mean more access to childcare, and that's a good thing. We worked hard with providers to create a new fix-it ticket for minor violations that gives providers an option to fix issues in the short term without facing expensive penalties. Exit interviews would also be conducted during these inspections, which will help create a more collaborative relationship between licensors and providers. We hold DHS accountable in many ways as well. We require the department to communicate via electronic means with license holding child care providers about changes to statute, federal law, rules, regulation, and policy so there aren't any surprises during licensing visits. DHS also must keep us informed about their efforts to remedy issues and we have heard over the last year related to enforcement, training, and paperwork. Child care pro um, providers who have also had correction orders overturned by appeal would now be able to remove the order from public posting. These orders are required to be posted for two years, even if they are overturned. Providers who work hard to care for children feel the postings are a scarlet letter that negatively affect their businesses. We fixed that in this bill. That's awesome. We clarify language about annual training requirements. Prohibit quotas for correction orders. Require DHS to work with providers about how their information is posted online. Strengthen integrity in CCAP to root out fraud and abuse so families that need assistance are getting it. And reform and invest in the child care assistance basic sliding fee program to make sure hundreds of more children statewide receive care, just to name a few additional provisions. Members, I look forward to your green vote. Thank you. The member from Washington, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would ask that uh, Representative Baker uh, go through the opioid article in the bill. Recognize the member from Candy, Ojai, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I want to um, also thank the committee for a lot of hours, a lot of time talking about a lot of many, many issues. But our quarterback, uh, Chairman Matt Dean, um, uh, put it some some good things here in this bill to get our discussion on opioids, and what we can do legislatively to get the conversation moving in the right direction. Um, and I'll just hop, uh, talk briefly about some of these. Um, medically assisted treatment, things like Suboxone and Methadone are things you might have heard of that are currently being used. Uh, we expanded that a bit to a drug called Vivitrol. That's a once a month injection from your doctor that uh, 
places a receptor on your brain that kind of blocks that feeling of euphoria when folks are struggling with addiction. And I think that's going to be a great expansion of our, of our use for helping folks uh, get sober. We also talked about changing the component of how do we assess pain. And doctors, you might have heard, get paid better if they take away pain. And I think that that's a problem, members, when um, we are encouraging them uh, in a way that might be uh, a little bit overreaching because we don't want to reward for prescribing more pills. And I think that uh, having this assessment of pain in a survey removed is a good starting point so that doctors and clinics and folks that are truly trying to help uh, our patients uh, by taking that question off there is a good starting point. I want to thank uh, the team for allowing us to have dentists limit their prescriptions of opioids to four days. Uh, how many times have you heard I've carried uh, 30 days or 30 pills plus out of a, a dentist office when I got a wisdom teeth pulled. That happens all the time. The, Medic the Minnesota Dental Association supports this four-day limit because they know that last year alone in 2016, over 100 million prescription pills were never even used after a tooth extraction. So we're filling up our medicine cabinets, folks, with too many pills. Uh, we also have um, uh, a sticker we want to put on your bottle of an opioid. When you go to the pharmacy, you open it up, we want to have a red sticker on there. Just to remind you, every single time somebody opens it up, hey, this is very addictive. Very simple, but we want to remind people because education is where this is going to get handled properly. I also want to thank uh, DHS with working uh, with us on uh, changing the way we look at chemical dependency and our way we're going to reform how we pay folks in the future. I'm very, very grateful that we've got some dollars in here to help our treatment facilities pay the bills because our our rooms and our walls are bustling at the seams in treatment centers and they need the resources and this increase will help them dramatically. So, uh, and finally I want to say um, uh, Representative Kresha has a very good bill uh, that I wholeheartedly supported with a, uh, a grant opportunity for folks like in his county, Morrison County and Little Falls that are doing terrific work on educating clinics around Minnesota uh, and they have a program of tapering folks in full-blown addiction back off so they can actually have a much better life and quality thereafter. after. So uh, we'll talk some more things. We've got some amendments as well. But I just want to thank the committee. It's been an honor to serve on the HHS Reform Committee. And uh, with that, members, I will uh, pass it back to our quarterback. Recognize the member from Washington, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was wondering if uh, Representative Backer might yield and discuss a little bit about emergency uh, emergency responders and transportation. Recognize the member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Um, speakers and members, this bill has a lot of good things helping with EMS, not just in rural Minnesota where I'm from, but in the metro area. First of all, we put together $200,000 for the CALS program, which provides trauma skills training for paramedics, EMT, and first responders, so across the state. We fully fund the Cooper Sam's Ambulance Volunteer Awards and Retention Program to a tune of $2.6 million. And what that means for us here in the House is when one of your constituents dial 911, it helps us get the rigs out of the garage because we have the staff, the volunteers, and so forth. We also add new funding for, um, of nearly $220,000 to the Volunteer Ambulance Training Funding in rural Minnesota. Um, as many of you know, I am an EMT. I volunteer, and actually when I get back late tonight or tomorrow morning, I take call, and I'm on call most of next week because I have my other members of my service help me out like today when I'm normally on call on Fridays. So very important for our small services. We also increase regional funding for all region EMS programs to a tune of $50,000. Um, for members who are not familiar, we have eight regional programs um, in the state geographically, so that puts $400,000. We also increase the funding through the state EMS board's IT request for $212,000. Why is that important? 
Um, we have to get every two years training. Um, we have 24 hours of regular training and then additional 20 hours. So we have 44 hours every two years to keep our certificate. Now we're able to do it online, make it easier so we can get more volunteers. We fund $800,000 to the State EMS Regulatory Board to assist ambulance services. We also fund ambulance intergovernmental transfers costs at $60,000 a year to all 103 government operated ambulances to um, leverage Medicaid dollars. And um, I serve on one of those government ran um, for the city of Browns Valley in which we um, service three, um, two states, three counties, and another nation. We serve a tribal nation where I'm at. Um, and then finally, we support to fix the community, um, support to a uh, fix to the community EMT um, legislative part to allow that good program to follow, and that's really used more so in the metro and suburban area. And um, I'll yield it back to the representative from Washington. Recognize the member from Washington, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And uh, just before we go to the amendments, I just want to thank. Uh, particularly uh, the uh, Democrats on the committee, particularly uh, Representative Aaron Murphy, uh, and for all the work on the committee and uh, for helping put the bill together for uh, over the course of the last uh, couple months and in the weeks ahead. We look forward to it. Also look forward to uh, continuing to work with the DHS and, and, the, uh, and health um, and all the great staff they have there. Uh, in working together with the governor's office to try to get a bill he can sign. And, um, and lastly, just want to uh, say thank you to all the direct care workers in the state uh, who uh, hang in there year after year and uh, work to provide care, uh, the best care in the world, uh, to, the, uh, to Minnesotans in the most need. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I think we'll move to amendments.